Awesome. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to We Come in Peace. Uh, I am your co-host, Heidi Little, and I am here with Lori. Lori, say good morning. I am your other co-host, Lori Myron Manbeck. Awesome. Fantastic. Hi, so we are coming together today in the name of um, peace, love, understanding, equality, justice. We have a packed program. This first segment is going to be about equality. Um, through, flowing out through the, the day, we have injustice. Then we have a panel on restorative justice, peace, unity, and a finale at the end. And it's jam-packed. There's going to be lots of stuff going on. Before we go into the schedule, I just wanted to take a minute to um, come into the space with you and just welcome anyone and everyone who is going to arrive here with us today and in the future through um, this beautiful thing called the internet. And um, the grandmothers and the grandfathers uh, teach and share with us that to change anything, to, to help anything, to, to be a part of something, um, to ask, ask permission of your higher power, whatever that is for you. Um, and to just really bring in as much balance and healing and clarity as we can into this space. We're gonna be talking about sensitive subjects today. We're gonna to be talking about empowering subjects today. We're going to be hearing amazing music and, and people's hearts and spirits, their work, and all of that just requires care and love and um, allowing to hear and to understand and to really listen and to be involved with something new, a new way forward, um, an empowered presence in the world. So it's the reason why I am doing this huge day of action is because our mission is love, care, and respect of all the children, for all the children. And um, I am a co-founder and director of International Children's Month, which has become International Children's World. And I work with We the World and um, Unity Earth. And we're working on just that, love, care, and respect of all the children. So I ask permission to be with y'all today and to bring in the highest energy that we can and the most understanding and the most healing and restoration that we possibly can in the name of art and music and co-creation and beautiful people coming together to understand more and move forward um, into something that works for people. Lori. Your turn, love. I, that was beautiful. Um, and I would, I would second the coming into the space with asking permission to, to be here. I would also second the coming in peacefully and just breathing and slowing down. Mm. And I think being incredibly open to all that comes today, because if it's a hard topic, if you open your heart and you open yourself up, you can hear it and you can absorb it. And that's what we want. And I, I think for me, Heidi, one of the reasons I was so excited about doing this day with you and, and excited about doing this whole Minneapolis Revitalization Festival, which this is a part of, is that it is time now. It is time for us to breathe and open ourselves up and make the changes that have to be made and make sure that everybody feels welcome and that all the children in the world and all the adults in the world feel like they are loved and have a place and that their voice is important. And so for me, that's what this is about, is sharing a message of we can do this, we have to do this because we have no choice. And I know, Heidi, you feel the same way that I do about the environment as well. So for me, all of this is justice. It's restorative justice for people and the environment, and we have to take those steps forward. And what I love about today, one of the things that I'm so thankful and, and grateful for, is that it covers so much 
And we even have a workshop on upcycling clothing, which brings us to the environmental piece. And since justice for the environment and justice for the people who are here and justice for the creatures who live here is also interwoven, mm -hmm. I think that it's a beautiful way to have the day. And so I'm so excited to hear all the speakers. I think we're gonna learn so much and I'm just um, looking forward to the day beginning and going forward. And so I just wanna breathe. Uh huh. All the way into my belly. Big so, breathe in the love, everybody. Love. Big breathe, breathe in the love. Breathe, breathe in yeah. the love. Breathe in the the call mm. to action. I, I love when when Heidi suggested that we call this the day of action. That is so perfect for me because this is a call to action for all of us. The yes, that's that's what that's what we're doing. We started in June with our first day of action, and this is a day of action, and we're gonna continue until. We can all sit on the beach together or whatever it is, right? We just that. keep moving forward. And at any moment, you know, it can all just work beautifully. And that is totally fine with me. And in the meantime, you know, we're going to show up. We're going to do the best we can do. Um, you know, this is the internet. So many yep. blessings to us for a graceful day of tech savvy. And, um, you know, people just feeling really good about what's happening. Lori, um, Talk to us. Your panel is later on today. What's your panel? I want people to be able to go. So we're going to be on facebook.com forward slash the we campaign all day. We have an extra bump blessing of the sine wave taking care of us for two of our panels today. Those are going to be Injustice, which is a new team of people to our network that we're bringing in. Um, which is going to be very exciting to have. They're actually going to take on the topic of injustice, which I think is going to be fantastic and deep um, and evolutionary, revolutionary. And then following that, we've got restorative justice. Your daughter, Catherine's going to be in there too, doing a breakout room session. So we invite people to find us um, around 1230 and uh, we're gonna move into the restorative justice portion, which, you know, today is the also Hiroshima day um, when they dropped the bomb many years ago in a horrific way. Um, so we're gonna weave in humanity here in every way throughout the day and how we can take care of each other better because how, why not, right? Like, let's, let's do this thing. And, um, so restorative justice uh, breakout rooms are going to happen about 1.30 and that's going to be on facebook.com forward slash the we campaign. And uh, then we have a brief for change uh, workshop and then we have a um, gentle parenting workshop. Um, these people are wonderful. They work um, with lots and lots and lots of parents and people are at home with their children right now. So very important we take care of ourselves and unite with people who can bring us balance and calm and and perspective and love um Lori what's happening with your panel who's going to be on there with you so it will be me um, Mary Harris who's a wonderful singer songwriter um actor and speaker and um Michael T Michael uh Rambo, I'm so sorry, who's also an actor and speaker in the Twin Cities, and Michael Houlihan, who is the founder of Bear, Bear Wines. Barefoot, right? Barefoot, Barefoot. thank you yeah. so much. Sorry yeah, yeah, about yeah. that. Barefoot. I like that. Stuff. And we are actually talking about um, use, living from your heart. So living from your heart and how that changes you and what that means. And later in the day, we're really excited because Rose McGee, who couldn't be here at the time of our panel, is going to come and talk about the same thing later in the day. And Rose is a wonderful woman who started Sweet Potato Pie, um, Sweet Potato Pie for Comfort or Sweet Potato Pie. I can't yeah. remember what the name of it is, but she started that and takes sweet potato pies to people um, who have experienced uh, violence and brings them to the community, hundreds of pies sometimes to communities that are struggling after police violence. So it's, yeah. it's a wonderful panel. And our goal is to talk about how it changes us if we live from our heart. Yeah, that's beautiful. And can you just tell people really briefly why um, you're putting this on? Yeah. 
So we started the Minneapolis Revitalization Festival, which started as an art auction, which is still going on. It's called Artists Who Share, and it's a beautiful auction with 120 pieces of art by 60 artists from around the world. It's quite exceptional. So please go there and look at the art and bid. Where and are people going? Where are they we directing are going them to? to there's um, a, an auction site. And I think I sent you the link, Heidi. So if we can post that, that would be really great. Yeah. There's an auction site that people can go to and bid. And what's wonderful about the art is that uh, the prices of the art vary from about you know thirty dollars to thousands of dollars because we have such a diverse pool of artists and Sharon Stone has a piece in our auction as does Pierce Brosnan as well as many pieces devoted to George Floyd which brings me back to why we started this mm -hmm. so the entire event was start was started with the plan of supporting the community of Minneapolis and St. Paul and also children whose families experience um, police violence. And so our goal is to raise funds and awareness and to help us move forward. That's what this day is about, to help us move forward, to celebrate our diversity and beauty because we can create such beauty together. And that's what the art auction is all about. And again, to raise funds to help rebuild the, the communities of Minneapolis and St. Paul. So I think you also have a donation link, Heidi, People can donate. Um, if you donate at least $40, what's very cool is that John's Crazy Socks has created a sock for us. So I may um, I may send you that image, Heidi, so you can share it because it's really a cool, <laughs> it's, a, it's a beautiful sock. Yeah, sure, sock. just plug anything you want to. And the, in the feed, after we have people running through today, just plug everything sure. in there. If, any, if anybody wants to help plug links, go ahead and I will definitely help with that. Yeah, so, that's going to be so we great. We this for that. This is about moving forward. This is about making the right decisions now. This is about changing the future. And, and you're raising money to revitalize the core of Minneapolis, right? Yeah. That That's the point. The point here is all funds are going to help rebuilding from the the damage that happened there. Mm -hmm. And and so stemming out of that is the um, also helping to clean the wound and apply the healing for the, the, the violence that happened to humanity there also. So, Agreed. all right. Okay. So that is amazing and beautiful. And you can join us today all day until eight o'clock PM. We have a one hour break over lunchtime, central standard time, and then we're back again. So the schedule is posted on facebook.com forward slash the week campaign. So you can check it and out there. The I'm sorry. There's also a schedule posted on Eventbrite. Gotcha. So you can also go to Eventbrite. Um, we come in peace. Nice. We come in peace day of action. Oh, okay, great. Okay, fantastic. Awesome. And uh, we'll make sure all the links are there for you to donate, check out the art and do all that good stuff. So fantastic. All right, Lori, you feel complete? You ready to rock and roll yes, the next section here? Yep. Okay. All right, good. All right, so welcome to We Come in Peace. This is the day of action. I am your co-host, Heidi Little, and I'm here with Lori. Um, Myron Men Menbeck, right? Menbeck. Myron Menbeck, right? yeah. Myron Menbeck, okay, got you. Okay, fantastic. Thank you, Lori. We're looking forward Thank to you. the day. Okay, so we are bringing in our first guest and... Uh, Rob, your name isn't on here. <laughs> Is he under a different name? Let me ask. For chance. I see Raheen is here. She's going to be helping us run. DJ Soda. DJ Soda. Gotcha. All right. Here we go. Awesome. Hey, how you doing? Great. How are you, Rob? You gonna turn on your camera? Uh, uh, you know, I'll turn all this stuff on. Let's see. Start video. There you go. All right. Awesome. How are you? I'm good. How are you doing? Great. Good day to you. Good day. Welcome. Thank you. All right. So, Rob. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself, and then we're gonna let you go to town on uh, empowerment for youth. Okay. 
Um, my name is Robert Steib. Uh, Rob, people call me, last name Steib. Um, also, my P I go by my uh, business name, DJ Soda, which is why I'm on here. As, so uh, I'm, a, I'm a DJ and entertainer in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and a lot of people call me DJ Soda instead of Rob. So that's part of the confusion. <laughs> so, awesome. Sorry, but, Thank you. That's great. We love yeah. music. <laughs> yeah. So a little bit about myself. Um, I, I, I'm born and raised in New Orleans, Louisiana, uh, until I was 12 years old. Um, my dad is from New Orleans. My mom is from Minneapolis. Uh, she went to Holy Angels when it was an all-girls school uh, in the 70s, or uh, 60s and 70s. She graduated. And then um, I moved here in 1993 from New Orleans. Um, I grew up mainly on the south side of Minneapolis. I graduated from De La Salle High School in downtown Minneapolis in 1999. And I graduated from a uh, uh, Southwest Minnesota State, which is a U of, a U of M branch school in uh, 2003. So I've been in Minnesota for a long time. Uh, I'm rooted here. I have family and friends here and I grew up here. So I have a lot of love for the Minneapolis Twin Cities area. Fantastic. Um, so what you going to, what, what's your work with youth and, and how do you want to bridge into that? Did you want to, um, yep. Yeah. I, I'll go ahead and start it. So yeah, um, I've been doing youth work in the community in Minneapolis uh, since the 90s. Uh, when I was still in high school, I was working with youth um, in basketball camps and summer camps and uh, youth program camps uh, all throughout high school and college. Um, when I got to after college, uh, I was the um, after school program director at De La Salle High School. And I also did development work for De La Salle, raising money through fundraisers and, fun and uh, different funding um for all the the christian brothers schools so there that would be like latino grave uh saint anthony de la Salle, uh all, all the catholic schools in the twin cities area um so that was how i got into charity work on a major scale in the uh, mid 2000s um and that was my first real interaction trying to do real real like long lasting work uh for, for the youth um i spread out after that and um ever since then i've had a mission to not only work with the youth, but encourage the youth to um, have investment and ownership in themselves as business and as business people. Um, so I've encouraged all the youth in the city around me to not only um, learn business education, but learn how to invest in themselves and their families. Um, so what we're gonna talk about today is just that topic right there, how, how youth education in finance and in business investing can create a form and a bridge for equality for not only disenfranchised people, but for the, the United States in, as a whole. Um, and you can, you can stop me whenever you want. So I, no, I that's fantastic. I love it. Okay, great. So are you ready to rock and roll? Cause we can just sit back here and you can, you can do the, you share, please. Let's can I up. just say one thing first? So mm -hmm. Rob is also mm -hmm. the founder of one of the organizations we're donating money to. Oh, great. So awesome. It's, it's called um, Twin Cities Stand Together. And Rob, okay. if you could talk about that very briefly so people know where the, where some of the money will be going, that would be really helpful. Yep, no problem. So um, dur during the George Floyd era of this summer, uh, after Mr. Floyd's uh, murder, um, I was called to action and I, I was called back to my community to help and get uh, things organized and under control. Um, so I was there on Ground Zero at 38th in Chicago. Um, I was one of the main organizers and uh, leaders in the community that was helping not only organize security and protection, but organize like um, supply and food, food giveaway and donation to the community as the community was burned down and everything was boarded up. So um, I took it upon myself with some of my friends to uh, go out there every day and uh, hand out supplies like baby diapers, baby formula, uh, toothbrush, toothpaste, just simple household supplies that people weren't, uh, weren't able to get because the stores were all boarded up or burned down. And um, we were out there every day just making sure people got that, that free meal, that they, they weren't getting a meal. And we just made sure like at a time of crisis that people didn't feel like th there was all despair. We tried to give some hope to the community that there was other people out here that cared about the situation they were in. And so we started a group uh, I started a nonprofit organization called Twin Cities Plural, T Twin Cities Plural Stand Together. Uh, we have a website called TwinCitiesStandTogether.org. 
uh, that you can go visit. It shows our story and it shows like, uh, a, a, it gives you a glimpse of like how many people we've helped during this time and uh, how many how many miles we fed and how much food and uh, money we've raised towards the community. So if you want to like more transparent a uh, way to see what the work we're doing, you can go to that website and it'll give you a little bit of transparency on uh, where the money and efforts are going towards the community. Um, and my intention when, when I started Twin City Stand Together was not just to feed the community and not just to give people free stuff. It was to encourage communities that they can do this too. And that we don't have to wait on our governments and we don't have to wait on our city council to make decisions for us. Like the people have to remember that the power is in the people. It's not power to the people, it's power in the people. And as a people, we have to rise up and we have to show our governments that they're not the only ones that can solve problems we can solve problems and we can fix things in our own communities. And we just need to encourage people to step up and do that. And just sometimes people seeing somebody else coming into their, come into their community and, you know, help them and, you know, you know, put, put ways of resources and in, in right in front of their face, it encourages them to do the same. And then that, that starts to spread like wildfire. And eventually the whole world will start to see that it's different ways that they can help their communities and they don't have to always have their hand out from the government to, to help them or save them. So that was why we started Twin City Stand Together is to create hope and to show people that we can do this. We can save ourselves. We don't have to have everybody else always come save us. So that's the real mission is to create outreach and, and encourage outreach in every community. So. And you see why they're part of our donation group that this is, I love the, I, Rob, one of the things I love every time I talk to you is that this is about people helping people directly, one-on-one yep. -on -one right. in the community, and I love that. So now we would love to have you talk about youth empowerment. I just felt like I wanted people to know about the organization as well. Yeah, no problem. It was my pleasure to talk about it. Um, and I, I just want to take a quick time, second, to thank everybody who helped us. It was a lot of volunteers and a lot of selfless people who gave up their like lives to come out there for uh, almost two months and you know cook for people and help people and serve and not not get paid a dollar. So I want to thank everybody that came out there because it was over a hundred people for two months that came out there, you know, whenever they could and donate their time. And and that's the kind of energy we need to like spread around the world. So thank you everybody that came out. We, we could not have done everything we accomplished without you. <clears throat> um. So to move on to to the, the, the business education side of this conversation. Um, one thing that ha has been an alarming um, problem and situation in our country is the defunding of education. And you know, people keep screaming about defund the police. Well, they've already defunded education years ago and we haven't been paying attention. There, there are some truly predominant public, public schools that either have closed or in danger of closing because they keep getting funding cut and they keep getting education cut from, and this is what the problem is, if our youth are our future, then why are we not investing more money? And why are we investing less money? We keep spending money on stadiums. We keep spending money on highway remodels. We keep spending money on, you know, putting up new skyscrapers and buildings in our cities, but we don't spend money building new education systems new education facilities, giving money to programs so that kids can stay off the streets and be in classrooms. And this is the real issue in America right now is that uh, not only mass incarceration and racism, but the de-education of Americans is the problem in our country. And they don't, the, our governments and our, and our states don't want us educated because then we will become more powerful as a people. And that's the real issue. They wanna take our power through our minds. And they they want us dumb, they want us uneducated, and they want us misinformed. And it starts with our youth. Our youth are the ones that are most influenced by all of this because th they grow up into people who are misinformed and uneducated, which causes things like racism and discrimination because of the miseducation and the misinformation that is put up in front of us. So it is important for our youth to understand you have the ability to change the future for us. You have the ability to learn and educate yourself and become the better version of us. And so I'm encouraging everybody to, to put forth this, this initiative to get education to the back of the forefront of our country's to-do list. Our country's priorities should be education 
before a lot of things that we are we are talking about. And one thing youth can understand is is that your the country doesn't want you to start early. They don't want you to start investing early. They don't want you to start learning how to invest early and to uh, learn how to handle your finances. But last time I checked. Uh, you know, we have 11 year old and 12 year old kids with paper routes and, and grass businesses and, and lemonade stands. But yet we don't teach these kids who are making money how to save their money, how to invest their money, how to start their own businesses when they become of age. And this, these are things that that children, young adolescent adults need to be educated on. The minute that you're able to work for somebody, you need to be able to learn how to invest your money and then learn how to spend that money towards investing in property, investing in business, and investing in yourself as a business. And people need to understand that is the real issue right now is, is that small businesses are being driven out of our country, you know, because they don't have education, they don't have proper resources and proper financing to, to save their, their business and what they built. And the reason for that is, is because they were uneducated. They were lacking the resources and information that they could have had a better plan for a situation like this to move forward. And we need to start pushing that initiative immediately to get better programming, specifically programming that educates youth at an earlier age. Our states and governments have set up systems so that they control our education. They tell us what age that we're old enough or mature enough to learn certain information. When we all know that there's kids that are very, very bright and intelligent, and there's some kids that have mental disability. So kids can range from, you know, learning slowly to learning very quickly. But we continue to like put an age limit on when kids can learn certain things and when and when educate what education is important and what education is not. I, I, I feel personally, it's ridiculous that business courses are not offered in every high school, but they're only offered in certain high schools who can afford the program and curriculum. And that shouldn't be a thing. If you can offer French and you can offer German and Spanish, well, then you can offer business, business education to high school kids. And these are things that need to be alarming issues for our country is that we continue to ignore the fact that we have been, we have been held back at every corner through education and through the resources in education. And in, for once in our lives, we are paying attention to the world as a whole. And now we need to tell the world as a whole, put education to the front of your priorities. We need to be educated on everything around us, including finance, including how the government works, including how policies are made. And once, once our youth get educated on these things, they become adults who can vote correctly. They can properly vet and, and read the information and make an intelligent you know, choice for themselves as adults. But right now, it's when you don't have all the information, you're not gonna make necessarily the most intelligent decision. And people need to remember that, that word intelligence, the key word is intel and intelligence. Intel is the gathering of information. But when you have a system that has been designed to restrict information from you at every corner, then you do not get to become intelligent. You are missing the key factor in the word intelligence, which is intel. They are holding information from us, which is illegal, I thought, in this country. I thought information was supposed to be part of our civil rights and the freedom of speech. And, you know, like, I don't understand how libraries and schools are closing, but then we have brand new billion dollar stadiums getting built in every city, every, at every corner. So this is becoming an alarming issue when we find that sports and we find that uh, retail, uh, retail development and real estate development is more important than education. And so that's the biggest thing in our country that I think has been, been ignored for too long and it hasn't been at the forefront of conversation and I feel bad for the youth is because you know they say that rioting is the um is the voice of the unheard you know but what about the kids the kids don't get the right the kids don't get to be heard they don't have voices we tell them what to do we tell them how to act we tell them how to walk and yet the youth are the ones that get infected affected the most by our decisions and they have no voice or no say so on their future which I think is a crime in itself that they don't get to choose how they educate themselves. And they should have a right to partially educate themselves on top of the education that their teachers and parents give them. Kids need resources to educate themselves, to read information and read books 
and find out what's really going on without being misinformed and miseducated. And the problem right now is we have the wrong people in charge telling us what the right curriculum is and what, what kids can and cannot learn. When I thought information and education was limitless, you know, and so the fact that they're putting limitations on us should alarm us even more because with limitations can come more limitations. And eventually we're going down the wrong path. We're, we're, we're not even a free, a free country anymore. We're becoming a country that's full of dictators and we're becoming a communist country where they tell us how to breathe, think and talk and walk. And I don't wanna see America go in that direction. America needs to go back to the direction where we are pushing education to our forefront. We are pushing our youth as the most important people in our country because they are our future and they are our future leaders. And if they're not prepared, if they are not properly trained and properly educated, then our future does not look bright. Our future actually looks worse than it is now. And we need to take action. Like this is what this, this panel is for. This is a time for action. And we need to create programs without the city, without the state, without the government. It, it's not illegal to create youth programs on your own. We can create community youth programs where we have control and we can provide resources and education and proper training for our youth that our state and federal government deems unnecessary or that they don't have resources for. And this, these are things that we need to have conversations about. These are things that we need to start uh, strategizing and planning action for. And then finally, these are things we need to start implementing in, in areas where they are defunding education. Right, um, right, right. right. Yeah. Oh, so, <laughs> so I'm just like, yeah, you're totally right on. And since I interjected on you and not realizing I wasn't on mute, <laughs> I'll just put in, you know, we, we run International Children's Month, which is June of every year and International Children's World. So you and I are new to each other. And so um, for eight years, we have been doing exactly that, giving children and parents the alternative option to what can help empower everyone yeah and we started that because what was there there was like poetry contests and art contests maybe you know where kids could get their stuff heard or seen and so we literally got behind all the youth that are rising up for the environment and all this kind of stuff so you are welcome my friend to um be a part of and share and educate you know the world through that portal because it's there. It, it's just not common knowledge because as you said, you know, like they're putting the money into these very interesting places that do not require the money, right? That's, it, it's, it's, it is ridiculous. And I agree with you hundred percent, everything that you're saying, I, I agree with you. Um, and I just want to, you know, validate how you're feeling. Cause I feel the same way and it's frustrating. And so it is about you know, parents and communities and self, right? Giving permission to self to be um, cared for and loved and respected. And then, mm -hmm. you know, extending that out to our family and our friends and our community and our world, because the children that are in these days, the, the ones that are, are now like in their 10, 11, 12, the 20 year olds, you know, and under that age group, you know, the last couple of decades of children, they're so smart and they have so much to offer and they want to be helping. They want to be involved and they have, um, they have a lot inside of them to share. And it's, it's amazing when you, when you give a child an opportunity to really show you what they know and how they teach and who they are. It's mm -hmm. amazing what they have. I just, I, I honor I honor them right now, you know, so <clears throat> you're not alone. And there is, this is happening and, and, and it's a movement and it's a yep. movement of love, care and respect. So thank you so much for, for being in there and spearheading and the, the talk on um, finances and governing systems and the truth about how things really work, you know, that's, yep that's a huge part that's not being addressed efficiently or effectively right now. Right. So it's like, right. let's bring you, let's bring you out further. I hope everybody sees and hears what you have to say today. Cause it's really important well, stuff. Let me also say this, you know, uh, I haven't forgot about you teachers, you know, and you educators, 
because that's the that's the biggest crime of all. It's not it's not actually that the kids are being held back by by some imaginary thing. They are literally cutting funding so that teachers don't get paid. And mm-hmm. so now what you have is the uh, the good teacher the good paying jobs for teachers are all out in the suburbs and private schools. So when you look at the schools in the city, they cut funding so that teachers teachers get paid the very, very minimum base salary that a teacher can get paid. And you know, in this economy where everything is like going up in price, you can't, the cost of living is going up constantly in our country, in most major cities. So teachers can't afford the base salary pay and the live off of that. So now they have to go get a second job, which means they're not efficiently doing their first job and their main job, which is educating kids. So we have to find a way to make education jobs more prioritized than police jobs. I don't know how police are making more money than teachers. It's ridiculous to me at every, at every sense of the point, like a cop can get paid to sit in his car and not do anything. I don't understand how you're getting paid more than a teacher who is in charge of your children for 20, like, you know, eight to 10 hours a day, right, right, right. five, six days a week. I don't understand how you're paying a cop more than you're paying teachers. Right. It's ridiculous. And that's the, that's the real issue is that now you have teachers who are not qualified because A, they can't find teachers to work for that salary. So now they have to lower the standards for the teachers that come in so that they, they get the teachers that have the bare standards to qualify to be teachers that, that come in for the job because they know they can't get another job. So they have to take that job and they don't want to be there. So that, that now you don't have commitment from the teachers. You don't have the passion or the care for the students that they're, that they're in front of. And that's the real issue is that we don't have that passion in education anymore because it's not financially feasible to live off a teacher's salary. And that's the real issue. We need more money so we can have better, more qualified people in charge of our children that can educate them properly. Not to mention the the curriculum needs to be changed. But before you can change the curriculum, you need somebody qualified to teach the curriculum. And that's the real issue. You know, we have unqualified people teaching our kids and then when you have somebody who's when you have a manager at a job who doesn't know how to do their job what they do is essentially train the people underneath them how to be bad employees so now you have a bunch of bad employees who are poorly trained so now when a new manager comes in that is trained they're like how did this happen you know how do you guys not know how to do the basic stuff and it's because they were poorly trained from the top and that's what's happening in education right now is our teachers are not properly educated so they come in and teach our kids how not to be properly educated. And the, and the cycle continues. And we got to break that cycle to where we're giving our kids proper resources and proper educational teachers. You know, these teachers need to go to school and be learn the things they're teaching and be experts at them before they go teach our kids. So, I mean, I don't, I don't know if there's like a one answer side to this, but it definitely needs to be addressed and talked about more as a, as a national crisis not a state-to-state crisis. This is a national crisis. Agreed, agreed. As we move into the next segment, that's exactly what we're going to talk about since you lit the fire for me on mm-hmm. that note. I love it. And, you know, so what, what you're talking about is a, is, a, is a systematic change of where we're placing our care, our love, and our respect, right? So we yep. want to go, because the plumbers are making more than anybody, and they're fixing toilets. And it's like, okay, hang on a second, but your kid <laughs> is over there with Miss Lovelight and she's got him our 11 hours a day and she's making $67 for the whole day. You know, it's like, it's insane. The, the, the way we think and where we're putting value is, it's insanity, honestly. I mean, seriously, it is insane to think that, you know, the care of the children and what they're learning and, you know, and it's a top down thing. The teachers only are only getting what they are being fed from their districts and state. So they yep. have to teach what they're given to teach. And when yep. you call the government, the, the woman who runs the education department for the United States government, she does not mandate what is taught to the teachers and she does not mandate what is taught in the schools. It's all each like separate entity, you know what I mean? And it's like, it's that thing that divide and conquer thing. So it's, 
it really, it really is like a humanitarian um, stand, right? Just to stand together as humanity and say, yeah. look, <laughs> our kids and their teachers are worth more than anything because mm -hmm. they're our future generations. If we don't take care of them, we're going to continue to move forward in the same broken ways that we've been moving forward from, you know, the beginning of when they made the schools to take care of the factory workers they were putting to work in steel industries and and the industrial revolution, right? So we still yep. are functioning on a model that was created years ago that is completely outdated the systems aren't the same the society's not the same the people aren't the same we're smart we really are intelligent people and so it's like okay great so you know to united standing together for what works for people i'm with you brother i'm totally with you i love it and uh and it's all about social emotional learning you know it's all about mindfulness it's all about whole child, right? Understanding like, who is this person in front of us? This cookie cutter way of, of working for people. It's, we're not cookie cutters. We are all sovereign, beautiful people with gifts who came here with a mission and a purpose and a reason. So, you know, it's like now, okay, great. Can we get to that, please? <laughs> you know, like, uh, I'm ready, you're ready. I'm sure a lot yeah. of people who are going to watch this video are ready. So, yeah. you know, and it and takes I, a, a team. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I, I want to address this. I've been doing a lot of research, you know, the, la the past few years on this topic called corrective learning. Mm -hmm. And if you haven't heard of it, it's basically a theory that says, like, at, as, a, as a community or a nation, or if you want to call it, we've been um, pushed in our direction where mentally we believe there's only one way to do things through education. Mm. or through through a lot of things that we do in life we we have been taught that there's one right way to do things when in actuality there's multiple right ways to do a lot of things and we haven't taken the time as a people to see that we have like option a option b option c option d go over go over everything in those options and then rationally make the best decision we normally go with what they tell us is the only route and we do that route without researching our options and correct, what corrective learning is, is that when you have somebody who believes that there's only one way of thinking or that there's only one way of acting, then you show them. You don't tell them they're wrong. That's, that's a human reaction. When people are told they're wrong, then they get defensive and angry and frustrated. And so if you can't tell people they're wrong, what you have to do is, is call corrective learning. You have to show them that they believe there was only one way but you can show them the other way that it's possible that the outcome could come out the same way they wanted it to. And once you, once you educate people on options, optional thinking, that there are other ways to perceive things and put yourself in other people's shoes without just saying, oh, they're like that because of this. Well, maybe this happened that caused this to make them be like that. Or maybe this happened, or maybe they have this. And then you start to like, wheels start turning in your brain and you start to open your mind and realize that no nothing is one-sided as they may have you think it is. Everything has multiple sides. There's no one, my way or the highway. There's no my side or your side. There's multiple sides always to look at things. Only things that are definite are called science, but people are not science. People have multiple things going on in their lives and in their mind and their emotions that cause them to act and react. So we can't just assume people are always uh, move or think or believe because of one action. There's a, multiple factors that come into everything we do, and we have to start doing corrective learning with the people around us. That's how we're going to get rid of racism and discrimination, is that we show them that all Black people aren't like this. All Mexicans aren't like this. A all Asians aren't like this. All white people aren't like this. Once we start getting rid of that perception that one culture is not everybody in that culture and that every individual has their own train of thought and their own passion and their own mind, then we will start to become closer as a people and not judge each other. We will start to open our minds and start to empathize with the person across from us and not judge the person across from us. And that's where, you know, corrective learning is something that, that's a big part of education 
that society needs to start implying. You know, that's not something you could teach in school. That's a, that's a social experiment that society needs to start doing. Don't argue with people and tell them they're wrong. Just show them, just articulate why you might be right. I think that's a terrific transition, actually. And Heidi, it's something, Rob, we talked about earlier that I think you heard, is that people have to start being open and take in information and absorb it instead of reflecting or deflecting it. Because I think that that openness to learn new things and the openness to believe there are other ways to do things can help us move forward and create the world that we want where everyone is respected and taken care of. So I think that was really beautiful. And then it comes to that thing is they don't have to do anything. Hopefully this is about inspiration. You know, hopefully this is about inner guidance systems waking up and going, yeah, I know I have something to contribute to this. You know, it's Mm -hmm. really important for people to use their hearts and their voices and their minds and their higher, higher perspectives, you know, of what, what is right from wrong. We know what's right from wrong. Does it hurt? Does it hurt you? Does it hurt others? Yes then it's not right, right? That's the bottom line. If it hurts, it's not right. So then, okay, we got to take a look at things. And and it's a very interesting time. Rob, I want to thank you so much for um, everything you brought to the table this morning. Uh, What a great way to set the tone for the day. And I I value and honor your um, work and your perspective and um, working with the children and the youth and, and, and bringing uh, education as an important thing that we need to really, like it really is a, a guiding force here. If we focus on education and taking care of our children, there's no negativity in that, mm-hmm. right? No. Focusing on, on focusing on something positive as a collective, that's a beautiful thing. So I agree with you, focusing on education and moving into that, into how we can make it work best for everybody. That's a great focus. That's a great movement right there. So may it lighten the hearts of everyone everywhere because children all over the world need that, right? Everywhere. And that amazing that we could come to this place, you know, um, because of breath, because of life and death, you know, that we can come to this place. So people are going to go to uh, TwinCitiesStandTogether.org to check out your work. We are raising funds for this organization today, uh, Twin City Stand Together Cause. And um, we are, we are uh, auctioning off art all day. Sharon Stone and, and, and other fabulously talented people have created and donated a lot of art for people to purchase and hang on their walls and be inspired by and continue to feel uh, the movement um, around them. And we're bringing you this day of action because we are not alone. We are all thinking the same things for the most part. And we all have something inside of us that wants to do better, make this better, help this move out of this pandemic into something that makes sense and works for people. It's a great opportunity. So we wanna thank you for your donations. Uh, hopefully Lori plugged the link in underneath the live stream because I haven't done it so far on Facebook. If not, we'll get there pretty darn quick. Um, we also need to plug in the link for where people can go to the auction. And, um, did you have any closing, closing things that you wanted to, to say, Rob, to your, the people who are going to see this? Yeah. Um, I would love to say this. Um, one of the initiatives, uh, Twin Cities Stand Together is in the middle of doing right now is I keep telling people, um, we need more ownership. And what I mean by that is is that the problem is most of the facilities that help the youth are owned by the city or ran by the city. We need to start pooling our money and resources together to start buying up property where we can have our own outreach centers in our own community that we own, the community owns. You know, like nonprofits in the community has full control over. So now that's what we're doing right now is we're in the middle of, uh, we're about to acquire a a big facility in downtown Minneapolis as one of the first of, of many, hopefully. And it's going to hopefully become a beacon of hope in the city where people can come and they know they they know they can get help without being turned away or without having to fill out 20 different pieces of paper just to talk to somebody. You know, they they put so much red tape on help and we're trying to get rid of that red tape where you can you can call, come in and we'll find a way to help you and give you resources for what you need. 
and people will feel like they won't get turned away because of how they look, how they talk, what neighborhood they come from, mm -hmm. or et cetera. You know, people need to stop being judged. Help, help is unified through every, everybody needs help at some point in their life. Yes. You know, it's, we want to make sure people, whether they're rich or poor or, you know, whatever, feel like they have a place in the community where if they need help, they'll get it. And that's, that's what I'm encouraging to happen around the world is like, you can do this too. Start to pool your resources, C connect with your people that have money and that have big networks in your community and start finding ways to buy property, start finding ways to buy blocks, buy whole blocks where you can have outreach for your community and you can have youth centers where you, the youth feel safe and you guys can keep them safe yourself. You don't have to rely on police protection. You can have your own community protect your youth. And this needs to happen immediately, not, yes. soon, not late. That needs to happen ASAP. Yes. Start getting these facilities and these outreach centers up immediately. And that's gonna help us rebuild the economy faster is if we, if we create more help without draining more money from the federal government, they always use that as an excuse to not give us money because mm -hmm. we, drain, we drain their funds by asking for stimulus checks, by asking for welfare, by asking for blah, blah, blah. So mm -hmm. they say because they're giving us all that money that there's no money. There's money, but we don't need to ask for their money. Your people in your community have money. They have resources. Please reach out. Don't be a, a, a lone wolf. Everybody needs to stand together right now, arm in arm, and because we're stronger together, we're weaker alone. So don't try to do this. Don't try to fix this on your own. You need to bring the best and brightest in your community to the table, and you guys need to talk about how to fix your community. Yeah, agree. And that's a wonderful way to put it. Um, you know, 500 people in a community pitching in two or three dollars a person, 50,000 people in a city pitching together a dollar a person. You know what I mean? Like that adds up, it adds up and it yep. helps, you know? And I think that that's perfect. Thank you so much. That What a wonderful, what a wonderful thing. The whole Thank thing, you. many blessings uh, to your work uh, and, and we're here for you and, and this is it. We're a team now. So thanks a lot. I'll be in touch. <laughs> My pleasure. My pleasure. That is great. Great, great, great. Okay. All right. So you have been with Rob Steep? Stibe. Stibe. Gotcha. Rob Stibe uh, with Youth Empowerment, Twin City Stand Together dot org. Um, go ahead and buy some art and support the work that these people are doing so that we can get a move on. All it takes is a couple of bucks. And all it takes is a little bit of belief and you'd be amazed what happens. Amazed. So many blessings. Thank you so much. And um, we'll see you next time. You're going to have to come back again. Thank, thank you for having me. You. Pleasure. Blessings to all. Thank you for having me. It was my pleasure to be a part of this. Thank you so thank you. much. Thank all right, love. You go ahead and hit your little red button and we'll see you next time. I'm gonna bring in Raheen Fatima uh, coming up here pretty quick. Thank you, Rob. Right. Take Bye, care, ladies. have a blessed day. Have a blessed day, thank you. Yay. You too, you too. You too. <laughs> right yeah. on, fantastic. Oh my goodness. Okay, great. So I'm gonna bring in, um, we're a few minutes behind schedule. All right, I'm bringing in Raheen. Go. Yay. That's amazing how that whole thing works. My goodness. So inspiring, really. <laughs> Hi, Raheen. How are you? <laughs> I am amazing. It was amazing what, what Rob was sharing because, you know, I feel the same way because, you know, I'm 12. I am working on a lot of businesses with a lot of businesses. And I feel like, yeah, um, my school is still teaching me algebra is not right now getting into business and finance and economics, but I feel like maybe I'm different. It's, it's it just reminds me of a movie that's Matilda and also a book. I mean, book based movies. And basically what happens is that she, ha she has, you know, she is really intelligent and she has a lot of brain energy, which she does use in studies, but she does not really have to work it out. 
So she gets into a lot of other stuff. That's good, like kind of me. Like I use it in my theater and I just saw like, um, yeah, Lori. I saw Lori and she was, you know, with the film festival and the artists and I was like, really cool. And being a businesswoman, like so much more and also empowering, empowering youths because, you know, if I am doing all that, I feel like other people, uh, other you know young adults and other kids with me should have the same facilities and that's what i'm working on and people around me even adults should have the same facilities so yeah that's a goal of my life and i got um four people today with me that will be talking on peace and its effect on children and yeah i hope it, it goes wonderful and yeah it's, it's pretty amazing okay fantastic so Raheen, we ha we have um, I'm going to bring your people on. Yeah. I'm going to ask you one key question. We're going to round table and then we're going to keep plowing through the program, okay? Cuz you're quick, you're fast. This girl is amazing. 12 years old, she's interviewing people all over the world about peace, about what that is. She's bringing in this fresh energy for all of us who have been working on peace for our lives and are a little like, oh my God, what's going on? This is taking so long. How come it got so heavy? What's happening? You know, it, it, sh these children have a, a fresh belief, which I think we all need. Uh, it's like a wash of fresh air and um, Lori meet Raheem, Raheem meet Lori and uh, here we all are. So you're going to get to meet a few outstanding young people who are being the change they wish to see in the world. They are doing it. Their parents are supporting them. And this is what that looks like for all you parents out there who've got these children who are like one of mine just hanging out and doing her art and hanging out in her bedroom. It's like, okay, there are children who are like going, yes, yes, we have a, a message and we're going to deliver it. So I'm going to bring everybody in. Um, I see Barira. Yeah, she's part of that. Okay, I see Hassan. Yes. And Lalaine. La yeah, like Lalaine. Yeah. Anybody else? Uh, Moorage, if you have Moorage. Okay, yay. All right, everybody. Hi. Fantastic. Mm. Yay. Yeah, everybody's you now coming up with, with their cameras on and unmuted. So yeah, it's pretty cool. Everything's going on like pretty fast. Pretty cool. Yep. Fantastic. Yeah, we're 20 minutes. We were 20 minutes. You know what I mean? You know how it is. It's yeah. live television. We're doing fine. Hello, Good. Heidi. How are you? I'm Hello, Robert. How are you? Hello, everyone. Hello. Yay. All right. Welcome, everybody. Welcome back to our friends who were with us in June for International Children's Month. Um, and welcome to our new friends who are joining us on internationalchildren.world. Uh, for the parents and, and family out there, there's eight years of free thematic empowerment activity platform full of different mindfulness, social emotional learning and um, parallel curriculum and offerings on the platform for um, helping support us in love, care and respect of self, family, community and the world. So that's internationalchildren.world. Okay, guys, so we're talking about peace and we're talking about a movement of peace. So that's what I would like for you guys to address. So let's talk about the movement of peace and we have about seven minutes, okay? So seven minutes on peace, the movement of peace, how you feel, what that is and how we can achieve it. How about that? Yeah, that, that, that's really perfect. Like okay. Start anybody else voluntarily start. Hassan, why don't you start? So oh, I, I will. Yeah, you will. Now you have to start. Come on, start speaking. <laughs> Actually, um, uh, uh, first of all, Heidi, thank you for inviting me, and Raheen, thank you to you for inviting me because you and uh, are like uh, the the work we all are doing all the panelists and everyone are the work we all are doing i think it's the bestest thing 
because spreading peace spreading happiness is really a great work um, which helps you a lot in many more things so peace is uh, take a huge part in our life because um we have we want peace in our families we want peace in our um, surroundings we want peace everywhere so we all are doing that work i prefer that uh, we all should uh, spread peace our aim is to uh, tell you all that how to spread peace how we have to spread peace why why we have to spread peace and all the things hmm yeah so um how do you think that uh, we could spread like peace we can spread peace uh, like uh, for example rahin um as the work i am doing i would like to share with you all that thing that i own an ngo um in pakistan which is actually its name is bhooke nahi soenge actually heidi you must you will also um like uh, cop, uh, like uh, you would all you because you are um a you are a foreigner and you are not living in pakistan so from the start of the lockdown um actually many people are daily wages here so they need a uh, food and they were hungry a lot from many days i thought to do this type of work i distributed ration bags which is um, ration bag is a bag in which you have one month of food i gave people that bags and like the people were that much happy and today i i can proudly say that i have I have distributed six thousand plus ration bags. I have distributed water bottles because the hot weather is disturbing everyone. I have distributed ice cream. I have distributed Eid packets because it's a great festival in Islam. So I think that I am spreading peace. This is how yes, you, you all can even spread peace in your that's country. That's here. Yeah, that's fantastic. Congratulations. That's a lot. and that's amazing. And so, you know, the children, this this whole event we come in peace is to help with the stuff that happened in Minneapolis. They had a lot of rioting. They had um they had police murder. They had, you know, the children are at home in lockdown. It's all that kind of stuff. And so, I think that it's really inspiring for people to hear that children are stepping up and making a very big difference in the lives of many many people and that this can be um supported here in the United States and in our communities and in our cities as well in this time of transformation so thank you so much for sharing your work i love you fantastic <laughs> that's great hasan and ngo at 12 right that's it all right who else would like to speak to to peace and what that means how about in action peace in action hmm yeah lalay like you want to go next okay thank you so first of all i would like to thank you rahim and heidi for inviting me and then i would like to tell you that in my point of view i would like to say about that to turn the culture of peace into a global universal movement basically all that is needed is for every one of us to be a true believer in peace and nonviolence and to practice what we profess peace and uh, nonviolence should become a part of our daily existence this is the only way we shall secure Uh, a just and sustainable peace in the world in the efforts to promote the culture of peace there is an increasing focus and attention on children who contribute in a major way to the sustainable and long lasting impact on our society a child's tendency toward either violent aggressiveness or nonviolence begins to take shape as early as age 4 or 5 that is why the culture of peace is focusing increasingly on children Yeah. And so true. that's why I would also you know like to add in this that what kind of, how can we you know maintain peace in early years you know uh, strategies and practices uh, must be generated to offer mechanism uh, mechanisms for sustained peace the links uh, between ecd early childhood development and peace building are crucial complex and uh, multiplicative 
firstly, uh, parental practices and the environment uh, that are most uh, proximal to children are key determinants of the physical, social, and emotional development. Proximal contacts uh, such as the home, family, early learning programs, and community protection programs play a key role in the child's ability to manage conflict, reduce violence, and shape key characteristics to the, of the child's moral behavior. Secondly, early childhood years play a crucial uh, role in the definition of child's emotional expression and regulation, physiological and uh, cognitive development. Cultural norms, identities, and uh, prejudices in terms of uh, child's behavior towards others. Thirdly, children who experience extreme and adverse uh, stress in their early years are at greater risk for developing cognitive, behavioral, and uh, emotional difficulties, which also reduces and delays their overall developmental processes. Their parents and uh, caregivers are more, more likely to be stressed and depressed and thus less are uh, able to provide young children with positive and emotionally nurturing environments. And fourthly, there is also a growing body of evidence which shows that the beneficial effects of ECD may have a trans, uh, gen transgenerational impact so that not only do the participating children have uh, greater peace in their lives, but their life experience with dealing from their behavior when they become parents themselves. Thank you. Mm -hmm. It was amazing uh, that all you shared, Lalin. Right. So uh, how do you feel like you're promoting peace? How do I feel peace? Yeah, I would surely tell you that um, in uh, my opinion, peace is uh, integral to human existence in uh, everything we do, in everything we say and in every thought we have. There is a place for peace. We should not uh, isolate peace as something separate. We should know how to relate to one another without being unpleasant, without being violent, uh, and without being disrespectful, without neglect, without prejudice. Once uh, we are able to do that, we are able to take the next step forward in building the culture of peace. We need to focus on empowering the individual, uh, individual uh, so that each one of us becomes individu uh, individually an agent of peace and non-violence. This individual empowerment will naturally have a global effect and overall impact on our society. Yeah. Beautiful. <clears throat> what I love the most um, is that uh, making space for non-violence, we have a, a panel coming up later on on non-violent communication with Rick Golfick from We The World. And um, you are all uh, here for We Come In Peace, which is a day of action. And it is focused on revitalizing Minneapolis. We have brought in some children who their lives are peace. That's what they're working for all the time. This is what they are talking about and cultivating with others. So I want to honor and thank you guys for being here and bringing in such fabulous information. And it's true. You know, it's like taking care of self, our families, our community, and our world, right? That's what we're doing here. That's what we're working toward. Thank you so much, uh, Lilan. I appreciate you um so much Raheen who did you want to talk to next uh let's go with uh Barira or Moraj you know anybody voluntarily right. start you know unmute yourselves and start talking yeah let's do it okay Barira, what about how about like you go next okay uh, so, um, Yeah, Moraj, go ahead. So in my opinion, peace is uh, really important, in like especially in Pakistan right now, as I belong to a military family, and like since I have born, I have heard uh, all about Kashmir, that they, uh, the li uh, they are being killed every day, and even right now, it's a really bad situation there, and even around the world, not even like only in Pakistan, and there's been fights, we can peacefully vote and as we do all over the world we vote we uh, to uh, then we choose so why don't we just use a simple way we vote whoever wins it's simple but no they want to create war they want to fight and it's all that so why can't we just think by one mind and uh, we can change the world by only one word but nobody's standing up and the person who are standing the uh, other people don't support them 
like i have seen a lot of my friends speak up for this thing they have made uh the i don't know the forms where you can sign and not mm-hmm. a lot of people sign them i saw them like a few days ab- a few days back they have made them very long ago but they only had like 1000 signs or something and those are also like our family members or friends not anybody else from the world or even from our country they don't want peace i don't know why and in my opinion peace is really important as it is uh and the way i spread peace around the world is not around the world like in pakistan we uh, at the beginning of the month we have this like budget that we have to spend on groceries for poor people and help um, the person who needs help and also if you know there's like this ngo sunrise for disabled kids and they collect donations and then they help the children so every month we donate them their money and i also try to spread peace and uh, send positive messages through interviews i do on my facebook profile so yeah amazing amazing work that you're doing moraj i really really appreciate you yes me too and you know um parents out there the children shall lead us the children shall lead us so i want please listen to what they are saying cuz they're speaking for the children of the of our country and of our world right now they all want the same things we got to grow up on mr rogers and Sesame Street here in the United States and it was a very um calm and nice way to grow up. We have um a great deal of information and a lot of things that are happening right now and the world can seem very large and very scary to some children and if we can cultivate peace then we can cultivate peace. And I think that's all that needs to be said on that one. So awesome, Barira. Did you want to say something to peace, my friend? Yes. Thank you so much for giving me a chance. So yes, I want to say in peace. What I think in this world, peace is the basic need of everyone, not only ch- children. But as in childhood, a child develops social. emotional and physical then peace become more important for child so if there is no peace as we say today in lebanon syria kashmir afghanistan all around us is war our future human nation is in great danger our human nation is failed to understand each other and you see conflicts are arise when we don't understand each other so i pray to allah god give us big heart to understand each other oh that's beautiful i second that thank you so much you're welcome yes thank you so much okay so rahin Let's finish mm. up let's finish up with you my friend what have you got to speak to this you understand the united states and what we're doing here today how can we tie this into what's happening in minneapolis and revitalizing the city with peace what do you think i feel like um again like you know summing up all the things that um of these wonderful friends said that a lot of people especially children are working on peace but it's important for all of you know the society and the community to look within ourselves first because you know we might blame others for doing something wrong but when we look within like we did that once we do that we might do something that would annoy somebody else or somebody else might not be so supportive of but we need to live with it in order to survive in a in a community and there's two more things that i've got to add up so um first there is the me we game that i am a brand ambassador of but it's not just you know i'm the brand ambassador of so i'm going to mention it everywhere but it makes like sense because what they're doing is that it's a game board like a board game and when you play it it's like it's really like 
kind of social emotional learning kind of mm-hmm. thing mm-hmm. and you would learn and this would really help into community building mm-hmm. when you play games together you would talk you would chit chat you would also and it's also a game where you have to kind of build a community anyway okay so it's a lot of uh things and you know uh it's like our brain it would understand a lot of things and when we understand things that are important mm-hmm. and to look within us within ourselves we would eventually lead to peace now um i have been conducting a lot of interviews from like all sorts of people not mm-hmm. just human beings but i actually interviewed an ai robot so you know it has expanded oh, yeah right you no know, mm-hmm. way over <laughs> So um you know astronauts uh Bollywood actors Hollywood actors like a lot of other uh people that might like sometimes uh you know be from the different religion from the different country maybe have a different mindset have a uh, a different uh thinking pattern but you know one thing that we have in common is that we are human beings right we are scientifically the same we are human beings you know we come from the same species in the kingdom and so on i'm not that good at science so forgot the rest and um everybody all of us we want peace you know my dad wants peace at home i want peace at when i'm working uh my mom wants peace when she's resting my brother wants peace all the time mm-hmm. so you know everybody of us want peace and peace meaning like nobody disturbs us and at times nobody would come against this or something but i feel like peace is the name of you know singing together talking together from pe- like two people from like really different uh you know uh very different countries or in religions and beliefs and a lot of other things like you you're you grew up in the united states you are there and i am in pakistan and i grew up here and i'm 12 and i'm actually from canada offense. you are I, I never am. knew that. Yes. Never yeah. knew that. I know. And Yeah. Keep going. Keep going. Yeah. You were on a train. You're you're fin- you're finishing up here. So <clears throat> we are each in different places but we want the same things. We're working for the yeah. same things. And exactly. I loved what you said about, you know, like your mom wants peace when she's resting. You know, people want peace when they eat. People want peace. They do when you think about it. when you hear it you think gosh that as an adult you think as you get older you think that might be harder than i thought but when you think about it the daily moments that you have where you want peace right let's lock into those moments i'm going to invite people to lock into those moments the moments in their day where they want peace when they're eating when they're going to use the restroom when they are driving in their cars people do want peace they really do and they get upset that they don't have it so the only way to change that is to stay in that feeling of what it feels like to be peaceful inside which is what all of you have said that feeling of what it is inside that you want to live on the outside because if you're mad that you don't have peace well then you're mad you're not peaceful Yeah. Right? If you're mad that you don't have peace, you're mad, you're crazy, whatever it is. So everybody take a big deep breath in, breathing in the love. Breathing out the love. And let's be grateful for the peace that we have right now because we do have it right this minute. Right now we're okay. We don't have anyone yelling at us. I don't hear any gunfire. You know, there's no there's no tension about us and other people right now and may our peace flow out into the world and help make it a better a better experience for everyone, right? Amen. Bye. Thank you so much for coming on and sharing your love and your peace with us and your work. And we look forward to seeing you again on other days of action. You are such beautiful people and I'm so so grateful for all of you. Thank you, Lori. We're thankful Thank for our panel of you. You guys That's were amazing. Yeah, amazing. I know, it's fantastic. It's fantastic. I can't wait to see what else we do in the future. 
Uh, right? Raheem, where can people go again. to continue hearing you? And where should we send people to see you more? Okay, so uh, all of us, we have our respective uh, profiles to so come and see our interviews. But uh, I will share the links so that Heidi, maybe you can share it or maybe yes, I can share yes, it down yes. below. And we're going to be doing a panel every second weekend for every month, starting after our 11 days of global unity in October, everybody's going to be circling back. So they'll be on internationalchildren.world. You're going to be able to yeah. find these guys there. And we have videos up already of what we have done previously. Um, send your children there, internationalchildren.world, get some new skills, some new tools, some new offerings, some inspiration, some empowerment. And many blessings to you all for your, your nighttime over there. Thank you so much for coming on with us today, ladies and gents. And I love you. I thank you and I respect you. Thank you so much. Yay. Thank you, thank you so much for having us today. It's so thank like you guys. Many thank blessings. You. Many blessings. Thank you. All right, everybody just hit that little red button. I'm going to bring in our next presenter and I love you and I'll see you next time. Thank you so much. Yay. Bye. Bye guys. Bye. Peace. Bye Lilan. Peace. Beautiful. So we are on a we come in peace and it is a day of action for revitalizing uh, Minneapolis and helping with everything that is going on. And uh, uh, Lori, who is our next guest? So our next uh, presenters are Tara Meyer and Garth Jones. Okay. And um, Tara and Garth are friends of mine actually from college and they are Aikido uh, awesome. instructors, pretty awesome. uh, established longtime Aikido instructors. And they actually, um, when I talked to them about the program, they said, you know, we've been working on a, a training that would talk about Aikido and how to use or how to respond to stress and um, difficult situations without using the fight or flight response. Because we talk a lot about you can either flee or you can fight. And they said, you know, using some Aikido methods, you can actually do something else. And I was excited about that because I think we're looking for options right now for things that we can do that are different from the norm. And oh, so yeah. they're, they're going to do some demonstration and awesome. they're going to talk to us about that. So Taryn and Garth, fantastic and awesome. I'm excited to see it. I'm going to mute All right. and get off the screen. Yeah, can sure. Can you, Welcome, you, everybody. Thank you so much. Let's get you queued up here. I think we can hear you. Yes. Yes. Good. Okay. We Good. just want to make just sure. Just testing everything because we couldn't test it before. Awesome. You are very dark, though. Yeah. Th this is. We're a little backlit from the sunshine. Oh, okay. Sure. They look All right. Really, we can like see it. you though. From the sun. Thank you so much. I'm going to go off now, and I can't wait to see what you're going to do. All Yay. right. Um. All right. So. First of all, we wanted to thank the organizers for uh, putting this together. It's a really powerful program and we're really excited to be a part of it. Um, I actually have roots in Minneapolis area myself. My parents live just south of Minneapolis. And so I have, I grew up in Iowa, but my parents live in Minneapolis, near Minneapolis. And so I have a lot of ties to that region. And so I have been very much touched by and interested in what's going on in Minneapolis. And of course we live in Pittsburgh and a lot of the things that started with, with, the, with the police violence in Minneapolis, the same thoughts came to Pittsburgh and we've had a lot of demonstrations, a lot of activism and a lot of uh, work towards how we're gonna move forward in a future where potentially this is not um, the definition of what happens on a regular basis. And so, again, I want to thank the organizers for putting this together, and we're happy to be a part of it. Um, I just want to introduce myself first. My name's Tara Meyer. Um, again, I grew up in Iowa. Um, I am a chemistry professor at the University of Pittsburgh, and I'm also a dean of diversity at my university as well. So I deal with diversity issues in my work as well as in my sort of private life. And so this is something that's near and dear to my heart. 
And I'm Garth Jones, and I've been hanging out with this one for over 30 years. And um, I've done a number of different things in my life, but primarily I design and build custom furniture. I'm a woodworker, and uh, I've been doing Aikido for over 30 years like she has. And so I'm going to start off with a brief introduction of what is Aikido, uh, and then we'll get into doing, doing some stuff here. So everyone has images of martial arts from the movies, from books, from whatever, and lots of, lots of bone breaking and violence. And, 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 and certainly, you know, historically, martial arts was a study of how to, how to win fights. And whether that fight was between two people or whether that fight was on a battlefield, um, it was all about how to make humans more lethal. And, um, and we've gotten very good at that, unfortunately. And so, you know, here is a, this is a book and it's a wooden version of a Japanese sword. We actually use these. But the man who invented Aikido, uh, who had done other martial arts in his youth, a Japanese fellow named Morihei Ueshiba, um, came along in the early mid 20th century and he looked at modern warfare in the modern world and said, well, there's no point in actually learning how to fight with a sword on a battlefield anymore. Uh, what is there a place for martial arts in our modern world? And he also just had a very different approach to life. And so he said, well, maybe we could use and adapt what we know in terms of generating violence and injury and death to find a way to, and I'm gonna use modern American language, which he didn't use, but to deescalate, to, to find ways of communicating less violently, to find a path forward that where if someone, someone is giving me problem, I don't get hurt, but my attacker doesn't get hurt either. Um, or doesn't get hurt as much. Um, certainly you can win a fight, you can, you're being assaulted, you can win a fight by just destroying your attacker, but wouldn't it be better not to? And, uh, and that's really the underpinning of Aikido. So while the techniques we practice, uh, go, some of them go way back, many of them have been adapted to be much less dangerous. Um, and so that's kind of the very basic background of, of where Aikido came from. Um, and so what does Aikido look like? Um, so this is a moment in time. Uh, there, there are moments in time. If you are watching this at home and you want to stand up and do some of the things we do at the same time, you can because there's some practices, especially if you happen to have more than one person at home with you. Um, you, can, you can practice some these things because we're not going to be doing anything that requires in-person instruction at the moment. But what does Aikido look like? Well, one thing, um, Lori alluded to this, you know, it's neither fight nor flight. So what do we mean by that? Well, say Garth was going to attack me physically and he started by grabbing my hand and he's probably gonna follow up by doing something terrible like punch me in the face. What should I do in this instance? Well, one thing you could do is get your hand away and run away. That's flight. And obviously in certain dangerous situations, flight's a good choice. But a lot of situations, you don't even have that choice. So what else can you do? Well, the other thing that people come up with is I'm gonna hit you back first. And again, that solution is applied quite regularly. But what's the result of that ultimately? If when someone attacks you, you beat them up. Well, if you beat them up, maybe they, you win that day, but maybe they come back with three of their friends tomorrow. Um, and that's the kind of thing that you need to think about. If you want to resolve a conflict with someone, you'd like to resolve it in such a way that more violence doesn't ensue. So Aikido presents options. And so one thing that you can be really cognizant of is he only is holding my hand. The rest of my body is still free. I have choices. Somebody said earlier today um, um, that we get bound by thinking there's only one choice. Uh, it was Rob earlier who said this. My choice isn't to deal with this hand. I can move the rest of my body. So what if instead of dealing directly with him or trying to get away, I simply change my attitude and move? Now we're in a very different situation. We're side by side. We're looking at the same things. In Aikido, we sometimes say that this is, I've changed my perspective so that my perspective is more like that of my attacker. We're not oppositional anymore. Here we're at each other, now we're doing the same thing. Once I'm in this position, first of all, I'm safe. He can't really hit me when I, do, when I go to that position, right? So I've already accomplished one goal, which is to get out of the way so that I'm safe. 
But now the thing is, I've also now had options of what to do. I'm not pointed at him anymore. So my options aren't to punch or kick him. Now that I'm here, what I could do is I could turn around, for example. Since he's connected to me, he might like to follow. Also, since it isn't directly oppositional, if I'm not trying to hurt him, he's much more likely to, to join with me. Humans are very programmed when they touch each other, when it's nonviolent to actually move together. We all know how to hold hands and walk together, right? This is something we do all the time. You can actually transform what feels like a very dangerous interaction to walking around together once you turn like this, you can go, oh, let's go for a walk. Now, this does not mean that my attacker is instantly changed into a person who won't attack me. But what I've done is I've extended the time period in which our interaction isn't something that we can't recover from. We expand the options. And in Aikido, the next thing that you would normally do under that circumstance, if the person continued to engage, is you might help them sit on the floor rapidly. So that would be throwing someone. Now, when you throw someone, they don't have to be hurt. They can just fall down on their rear end and it's over. Or you might pin them, hold them in such a way that they can't get free easily so you can have a discussion. So from here, right, once I turn, I could actually help my friend sit down. Once the person sits down, Again, they would have to make the choice to stand up and attack again. And maybe they won't make that choice. The other thing that I can do, right, is I can pin the person. So I could do this, and I could take my friend down and say, this is hard to understand, but if he tries to get up, he comes into pain. If he stays down, there's no pain involved. And so I could say, really, do you really want to hit me? And again, Aikido does not think about victory as the goal. Resolution is the goal. And I noticed in the program later, there's something called nonviolent communication that's going to be discussed this afternoon. Aikido is the physical manifestation of nonviolent communication. You'll find in the nonviolent communication, there's a big, there's a deep connection between the Aikido world and the nonviolent communication world. Lots of people who do both. And so, this is where we're, how Aikido manifests. So with that in mind, the other thing we wanted to show you is what does Aikido look like if you came to a dojo and you joined the dojo and you practiced Aikido, what is it we do? And so uh, we were gonna do a little bit of sort brief, of- A brief demo. A brief demo of some, what Aikido looks like in motion. Yeah. And I'm gonna fall down a little. It's early in the morning. All right, so, and I wanna preface this by saying that I, when we're doing Aikido, we always have the choice um, between, in terms of how we respond. And, and, and one of the things that I think is important to keep in mind, and this is a little bit of a change of topic, but I'm gonna just bring it up, is the idea that do we wanna be pacifist or, or whatever? And Aikido is not passive, it would be active peace. Because whenever we're in a conflict like this, I have the option. So, uh, Katana Dori. Here, I can throw her nicely, or, and I'm not going to do this, I'm just going to show it. Here, I could get to the point, I don't know how well you can see this, my hand's on her throat, where I could probably twist her head and break her neck and kill her. Right now. Right this second while you're watching. I, she has given me, she's given me her trust, I could do this right now. Obviously, I'm not going to because that's not the goal. But we have choices. Close up. Oh, sorry, sorry. sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. I meant katana. <laughs> Doesn't matter. It's all good. So. Okay. 
Yes, sir. Okay. All right. So just a few techniques. We could keep going, um, but I know watching Aikido for the first time, it all becomes a blur very quickly. Uh, and Tara wants to put her microphone back on and say something. So you can talk to me in a second. So. One of the things is I obviously have been trained to fall down without hurting myself. Um, anyone who practices Aikido gets an extra bonus of learning how to fall down, which is good. But even if I weren't trained, none of the things that he did would hurt me in a permanent way. Again, they might be a little bit painful. I might get up with a bruise. I might have a strained arm, but I would end up in a hospital. And I think that's one of the things that is deeply involved in Aikido responses. You don't break people's arms. You don't humiliate them. You don't, you give them options so that they can get up and make a different choice. Do you have anything else to um, say? No. All right. <laughs> so I think the next thing that people always think about martial arts is they're like, well, nobody really attacks me in my life. So why should I do a martial art? Somehow I live a life where really people don't attack me, so I don't really need to do this. Well, it turns out you learn a lot about yourself and about how to deal with people psychologically if you practice it physically. Um, when I first started practicing Aikido, I probably thought I was a pacifist. But after practicing Aikido for a little while, I realized but I had never had the option physically of being violent. And I had to learn about myself. And I learned that it wasn't pacifism that I was after, justice, equity, yes, but not pacifism. And so one of the things about Aikido is it teaches you a lot about yourself. And also it allows you to practice things physically that manifest in your life psychologically. Again, I'm a I'm an administrator in a university. I use Aikido every day. Not because my students are attacking me, thank goodness, but because there's a lot of conflict. And what do I do when there's conflict? Again, do I want to fight? Do I want to run away? Neither of those are reasonable responses in most instances. I want to hold my center. This is something that we talk about a lot. You, you want to, and, and I think this is something that Lori was alluding to earlier, and it's going to be talked about this afternoon. You want to act from your values. So in an Aikido sense, in a physical sense, that means that you stay in charge of your own body. You respond from a place that is your values. In other words, you don't hurt the person. And you have to actually, and this is the part of Aikido that is really, really applicable to psychological conflict, is you have to welcome the contact which seems crazy, right? Someone's about to physically attack you. You have to actually acknowledge their humanity and welcome the contact for Aikido to work. Aikido doesn't work well if you don't do that. So if Garth is going to attack me, he's going to... I have an idea. Oh, Garth is going to attack me with a stick. So, sword. Yes. So, obviously we're not really practicing to defend ourselves against sword attacks because that doesn't come up very much in the modern world. So if we just use the sword, I mean, it is actually a piece of hickory. It's dangerous. If I hit her with it, it would really hurt. Um, but if we use this to sort of amp up the psychological threat, not only am I a person that's about to attack her, I'm about to try to hit her in the head with this stick. Um, and if she worries about, and if she tries to turn and run away, I will catch her and, and hit her before she can get away. If she tries to just come straight at me, I will hit her with the stick. And if she worries too much about the stick, I will probably hit her with the stick. But <laughs> so what I did is I hugged him, which is actually a really effective response because you notice how he lost his balance and couldn't do anything. So here he comes at me. Hi there. I have, but I had to want to be close to him. And the other thing is contact is very different. People react very differently. Just come over here. If I try to do something to him that's bad, he tightens up and he fights back. If I decide to hug him, he immediately as a human knows 
it's different and can feel it. And as soon as he feels that energy change, he doesn't fight it because he can tell it's genuinely for him. And so Aikido requires, and this is something we talk about a lot in our dojo, it requires that you actually have a nonviolent attitude towards your attacker, a compassionate attitude. Because the minute you try to do things to them, they tighten up and fight. If instead he grabs me and I just sit, put my hand down, and I say, oh, let's sit. Sorry, I, oh. I, I would have fallen, but my back's a little stiff. Yeah, <laughs> but if I just say, all right, let's reach to the ground together. If I do something that isn't against him, that doesn't scare him, he's much more likely to go with it. And that little change in his brain can make a difference. So this is the fundamental pieces of Aikido. Is there something else um, you wanted to say on this? I want to look at our notes and see if there's anything that. Well, I was going to end with. Yeah, the... yeah, yeah. Um, I think that. Uh, I, I want to do one dysfunctive kind of demonstration. Mm. So one thing that, you know, sort of a practical, we, since we do all this physical practice um, and people say, well, is Aikido good for self-defense or is martial arts good for self-defense? Even self-defense where you're trying to be compassionate and so on is that there are many, many ways of getting out of a situation. So we're going to demonstrate one really quickly. I'm now the creepy guy. She's the lady in the bar that I'm creeping on. And I'm going to come and, you know, I'm not actually going to grab anything, but I'm going to come and I'm the unwanted, come on, let's, let's, let's go have a good time, you know, and she, and, and uh, she could try to push me away, but I'm bigger. Now I'm holding on to her and she can't get away from me. And now, she, and, and um, she could try to stomp on my foot and, and hurt me, but maybe I'm half drunk and I get mad and I just start hitting her in the face and all goes badly. Or... I don't know what happened. She's over there now. My wrist felt funny for a minute. And now she's saying, back off, dude, and walk off, and she can walk away. So, so, it's, and so there's the physical technique that we can do, but it's also a change of mindset, going back to the, she didn't run away, she didn't fight. And, but she also, as Tara was saying a minute ago, has to accept that this is happening. If this is happening and she tries to deny it to herself. Or fight. Or fight or whatever, in these typical scenarios, she's going to be in Instead, I, 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 I can nicely grab a hold of his wrist. Hi. And this seems friendly. Duck out. And then duck out. So just one example, but uh, and I think that's. Yeah, and so I think now bringing this around to what, what would we like? It turns out Aikido was very popular in the early 70s. Um, it came over from Japan around that time, but also it was right around the civil rights demonstration time, right around the anti-war demonstration time, and people were looking for other solutions to conflict. But I'll tell you, in the last few decades, MMA has gotten to the top of people's interest, cage fighting, not looking for new solutions to this. But we're in a different time now. I think the last few months between COVID and police violence and Black Lives Matter and all of the things that we've, we've witnessed and been a part of, I'm really hoping that people are, like the people who are attending this, this today's uh, day of action, are going to be interested in looking for new ways to respond to violence and to interact with, their, with humans. And so what I'd really like to say is I think more people should practice Aikido. In fact, the person who came up with this saw this as a method of personal transformation and a way to bring peace to the world. And so. Aikido really teaches you in your own body what it means to be nonviolent. And it, it's very visceral. You can talk a lot about, about a lot of things and go, I'm a good person. I feel happy about people. But a lot of the same people who talk that way, if you say something to them that triggers their fear, they want to hurt someone. And Aikido allows you to practice over and over again until it becomes part of you to respond in a way that allows you to deal with it, that in a way that doesn't hurt you and doesn't hurt your partner, and you get that practice in a very safe space. Aikido dojos are generally really safe spaces where people 
can come in and they're allowed to progress it the way they need to. And people can progress at their own pace. There's no competition in Aikido, for example. We don't have sparring matches. And so I, I think I would encourage you to look for dojos in your community. And I know there are dojos in your community because I practice in them because we travel around and we see other Aikido people. And so if you were to go in, in Minneapolis, I know there are dojos. Now I'll say it's COVID right now. So your dojo, local dojo will probably not be open. And even if it is, it won't be that excited about accepting new people because we can't really touch each other right now during COVID randomly. But that doesn't mean that in a few months, hopefully, hopefully <laughs> when COVID has let up that they won't be going strong. And I would love to see a whole cadre of people come out and go, I want to learn more about what it means to practice nonviolent communication in my body. And I just wanted to add that I put in the chat, so hopefully people can see it, three web addresses. One of them, the top one is AlleghenyAikido.com, which is our dojo's website. Uh, my email address is there. If you're interested in learning more about Aikido and you don't have to be in Pittsburgh, I would be more than happy to reach out to me. I'd be more than happy to help. Um, the second one, ASU.org, is the national organization that our dojo is a member of. There's dojos all over the country. We're not the only national organization, but this one's ours. And then the last one is the Twin Cities Aikido Center, which is in Minneapolis, St. Paul. I think it's actually in St. Paul. But anyway, it's, it's in the Twin Cities, and it's been there for ever and a day. And so that's the big local dojo if you happen to be in the Minneapolis area. Um, so uh, Awesome. Um, Fantastic. Thank you so much, you guys. Uh, that was incredible. And, you know, um, just great appreciation for the art form and uh, and the practice uh, of nonviolent communication through a warrior embodiment. Really, we're talking about self defense within the body that is not um, picking fights. It's trying to what would you use the word? What was what would the word be? De-escalate. De-escalate. There de we go. Perfect. Perfect. We're, we're really into de-escalation. Yeah, we appreciate that in these times. That's fantastic. Um, Karen, oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, there's a definitely a way forward that embodies strength and resilience, but it doesn't need to be violent. And uh, and that's that's I appreciate that so much. Um, all of that, uh, Lori. Uh, Taryn Gar, thank you so much. And I especially love the idea of changing your physical body position so that you are sharing your um, partner's view. And I think that talk speaks so much to us about sharing our perspective and or changing our perspective so that we can see where someone else is coming from. And it changes everything. So thank you. Yeah. Well, thank you for inviting us. And I want to plug this afternoon's nonviolent communication uh, workshop and then afterward the acting from the place of values workshop as well because I think these are all really tied in together they're all a piece yes yes this whole day of action ties in together we appreciate everything that you've done and people can find out more for this afternoon's panels by joining the facebook.com forward slash the we campaign we'll be going live all day you have been watching a segment one of we come in peace for um, artists who share and revitalize Minneapolis. And uh, we have just seen, please reintroduce your dojo one more time. And are you gonna be doing online classes just really quickly? Are you gonna be so, teaching this online at all or what's happening? So uh, we're Allegheny Aikido in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, uh, AlleghenyAikido.com. Um, and we do have, um, we're teaching two classes a week that are both on Zoom. Um, the challenge with online classes and solo practice is that it's very hard to teach the absolute basics, not in person. So gotcha. while, while someone could sit in and we'd probably be welcome them, it might seem a little high end and obscure. Uh, we're, we might be doing a weapons form or, or solo body work or something where it, it's hard to know what that relationship to what you saw in the demo is. Um, gotcha. So this is, this is the challenge with teaching Aikido online and we're still, still figuring this out. But if someone's interested, please send me an email. And, and if you just uh, have questions, you can reach out. Garth, yeah, Garth will help you find a dojo if you reach out. Um, he'll help you think about it. So feel free to reach out to us. We'll talk to you about it. Yep. And if you're really Fantastic. interested in coming to a Zoom class, let me know. Great.
Okay, so we'll get all those links into the comment section underneath this, this video. And uh, we are going to uh, end the live stream now and be back with segment two in about three and a half minutes. So thank you so much for being with us today, you guys. We really appreciate you. And uh, you. we look forward to seeing you again later on in the day. All right, everybody, we come in peace here with Heidi and Lori, and we have more coming. Next is going to be the injustice segment, and it's going to be very interesting. So looking forward to seeing you all back here in just a couple of minutes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.